Linda Havel is a poet and a storyteller who lives in Framingham. And as she wrote in her paper bio, with one perfect husband, <laughs> and she said, I feel certain that I'm descended from astrologers, seers, witchers, court jesters, and cave painters, my reason for unraveling and raveling. Linda has been a vibrant activist of community arts for decades, and she studied life cycle development at Lesley College with a concentration on aging and family psychology, and she attended a storytelling conference at Lesley, and that opened her world to storytelling. And she didn't let that one uh, community of the arts confine her. She also began writing poetry in the 80s with a small group of women poets in Wayland, and that's where she met Ruth Harriet Jacobs. And she started writing poems about finding herself after being introduced to feminist writing in the 70s, and then to personal family stories, pertaining uh, poems pertaining to her own life learning and family letters, including those of her paternal great-grandfather from 1878 to 1922. And the love of both poetry and story ignited um, for her, and especially after meeting Brother Blue yeah. in 1991. And since then, Linda has been an activist of poetry and story for people in all stages of life, from preschool to elderly, by helping people of all ages and walks of life find stories and, po and poems within. In preschools, in grades K through fourth, she's done residencies on experiencing myth through storytelling and reading counts, and she's worked with people in their last years of lives at independent living centers and nursing homes. And in fact, doing so much good work, Ruth Harriet Jacobs encouraged her to give a lecture on women and storytelling in Nova Scotia in 1999. And since then, she's given a number of other lectures and presentations, including When Life and Art Imitate Each Other, Family Legacies, Women's Stories and Family History, and most recently, Stories into Poems and Poems into Stories. And she has a chapbook, Gathering Threads, and she's a contributing column editor for the Muse Letter for League of Advancement of New England Storytelling. She is a true pioneer uh, bridge for poets and stories storytellers to interface in our communities. And Linda said, I will end with, the sharing of poetry and story gives me an expanded vision of myself in others. So here we are to join with Linda and to learn from her and what she has to share. Please give me a warm welcome. I'm always thinking about story poems, as Cheryl mentioned. Um, ever since Brother Blue, I wanted to tell stories. I would hear them told at the Porter Square bookstore 20-something, um, 20 22 years ago at least. And I wanted very much to get up and tell some kind of a story. Um, it, it just evolved after a while that the stories felt like poems, but I didn't yet know what the techniques and the important ways of writing poems. So I would come every time with little snips of paper thinking that's the story. And they were scraps and pieces. Ruth Hill would watch this and smile. And I'd get a story out, a little story, but it sounded like a poem. My first and only chapbook uh, was a gathering of 11 poems. They were parts of becoming a grandmother, commuting to California for five grandchildren's births over time. And so I made them into poems, and I um, thought of them as like threads from childhood on, all about family life. It was like me over and over in my mind. I have um, some newer poems that have evolved, um, and they're yet to be printed. Uh, very soon they will be printed. They'll become my second chapbook. But as I read to you, I'm still weaving. I'm weaving so that they'll find a place to connect, just as threads they are always seeking to find a pattern, I think. 
Also about the fact that many of them feel sad um, over the years. I thought, oh, can I only write a sad poem? But they're really not sad. As I said to someone earlier, they're um, sad, but they lift all the time. I really believe in Shelley's words. He said, our sweetest songs are those that tell us of the saddest thought. Um, my own become urgent messages. So here is the first one called Always Beginning. To make up for lost moments, I'll walk by wetlands again, go back and find those crying paths, the soothing sounds of killdeer calling and diving, I like to notice the way knots on trees here by our lake sometimes morph into faces I knew. The year the lake froze early, my mother was still able to tell how she loved the way leaves fell, all colors. I still see familiar shadows everywhere around the lake. Now there are no leaves or bugs in sight. And when summer arrives, I'll pick raspberries, but I'll save the new pink clusters so they'll turn a deeper red. I have a predominant thought these last few years about something I call away sickness. We go away frequently to California to see our growing grandchildren and sons who live there. And we're always kind of leaving and coming back. And I get something called away sickness. And this is the poem that I wrote. Each time I go away, then, return home, my old neighborhood, so familiar in memory, is not there. Change happens. I know how it is to be away and meeting new people. They'll never know me well enough to belong to. If I tell about home, it begins with an underpulse, like a feeling of throbbing. And home becomes that hole patched and torn from where I need to find myself away. So I've been holding on, too, with the help of poems and stories and stand on a fault line that's between past and present. And then I want to tell you what I wrote. On the third Tuesday of the sixth month of the year of the rat, 2008, on the West Coast, It's not that everything is so confusing, which it is. Still, each new event, marriage, birth, graduation, and sometimes death, signifies change. Nothing ever stays the same except the way we greet each other say goodbye, then hope it will all happen just the way it did last time. But it doesn't. Another year's passed, and all the while, we're planning for next time. It's not that everything's so confusing. No one can ever know each other's dreams 
or secrets. But I want to show more. A younger family walking through canyons along a ridge looking for mountain lion prints. Upon each return, we see ourselves. It's almost like a scene from a movie. Our walk-on part shown again and again. It's not that everything is so confusing, but when my mind replays sounds, loud rap music in the same flow as a memory of eucalyptus scent, I want to tell another story, write a poem about how change is in the blank spaces. I have no new words yet about the sight of designer homes placed where mountain lions lived or that our picnics, once with family, have become a search for fusion food dining. It's not that everything is so confusing. Television sitcoms are about the way we live. Digital frames play our stories faster and faster with images that are reflected in AARP Secret Victoria Walmart Mall. How will we know who we are as we pass through several time zones? Some even say we're in a parallel universe. So this traveling here and there as we age Joseph and I, my husband. We've loved the Borrego Desert when we've been on the West Coast. We love Florida since my parents lived there for so many years. In 2008, I thought about where my muse is, if it's out there, and we were in Venice, Florida. I sat by the water and I wrote this poem. I'm wary of my muse in the early morning. What could we together write about? Lizards crawling through mangrove tangle, aimless sailboats untrimmed, <coughs> anchored, their rough motors a dull vibration, canceling out soft rock music. Heat and signs of a throbbing quest, unlike the egret who lifts each stick leg, Tai Chi-like, in weightless composition just before flight. We soon hope to go over and see Florence, Italy for a week. But um, I thought about this uh, in a visit also to the Borrego. Real poets don't wait for the muse. They invite her, then revise and edit with love balanced precariously on top of the work of their lives. Sometimes I said it was real storytellers, but here it's real poets have a way of thinking that's juicy and severe. They know how to leave out anything tidy or sentimental. My muse wakes me early, chides me for my concern about getting my money's worth in each vacation. The next is certain 
to be another search for something. Wake up, she whispers. I almost tune her out. Reflect with me. I'd rather spend my time writing about the past. But in Florence, I'll see what it's like to live in their past and present. With so little time, she tells me I must go slowly or it will make us both weary. Now you know how it is when you're doing something very ordinary and mundane. Well, this is again from 2008. I was trying to pick fruit in Stop and Shop. I sniff, squeeze, shake melons, plums, and peaches. And peaches have no scent. A purple, soft fruit I hold in my hand brings on a memory. It's like salt air, ocean waves at New York's Rockaway Beach. I can almost taste the red juice on my lips. My mother always packed plums along with liverwurst spread with sweet tomato relish sandwiches. I still smell and taste that summer fruit and the promise of beach time. I see my brothers and I running into and daring the rough surf to keep us afloat. The lake enters a lot of my poems over the years and this one is called Lake in April. Everything here longs for permanence. Believe me, change comes faster in April. Back in December, the ice took forever to freeze. Finally, making a quick escape with hardly even a curtsy, the sparkle is back. All through this mad rush into promised spring, a good time to remember how it is living near a lake. Long before there was ever a house with a lake view, a glacier quietly melted, millenniums of upheaval, old trees gone down, roots exposed, then came renewal. Crows are still to this day calling up the sunrise and acorns loll all around the pond. I also know if I look too closely, I'll see my fears in this 21st century. Like trees, my roots will be torn free. It seems like I need to play more. Um, and I realized that back in November, I was just still hanging on to a lot of the hard um, stories and thoughts. And um, I titled this one, A Little Lesson in Creative Playtime. I think it was May Sarton suggesting that each day relieve discipline and order, which is what you're supposed to be as a poet and a storyteller sometimes. Relieve it with some play and pure foolishness. That's what May Sarton said. Late last fall, as glorious summer departed, my printer suddenly forgot how to print. My one last unwritten poem, slumping listlessly, waited inside me as I dreaded cold days ahead. An idea about playtime perked up my spirits. 
Once I heard a dear friend tell about adorning her beloved dog, Junie. She'd drape, drape a few leftover dandelions all over Junie's head. There is time to play. What a relief. Seek out silly fun. Not to worry or imagine despondent poems still lurking around. Lucky for me, I had no printer, only milkweed pods bursting to be blown and dance with me. I'll wait now for the seeds to germinate with poems all coming to life in spring but then I'll have a new printer. Skinny little toehead boy with your brother on the stairs Eating chocolate ice cream cones In your cotton underwear And oh My dear sweet John Little fish In a little pond Oh, it always seemed to me you were dreaming of the sea rehearsing for a college play friends with all the castaways didn't know it then but those might have been your better days and oh sweet John Little fish in a little pond Oh, it always seemed to me You were dreaming of the sea Never had an unkind word Never had a claim to stake Never had an argument Never had a lucky break And oh, my dear sweet John Little fish in a little pond Oh, it always seemed to me you were dreaming of the sea Back inside your lonely room Trouble seemed to follow you Why'd you have to hide it all? None of us ever knew And oh, my dear sweet John Little fish in a little pond Oh, it always seemed to me You were dreaming of the sea Oh, it always seemed to me You were dreaming of the sea Because he bragged that he could outsing them, the muses blinded the bard to Myrus and made him mute. Then, out of pity, they made him 
the groom of Pegasus. His feet stamp, his nostrils blow, his wings beat the wind. I love his musty smell, the weight and wetness of his nose on my bare shoulder. He goes to sleep, snoring a little. When the owls finally roost and small creatures can safely sleep, I can sleep too. I'm not lonely on this high slope of Mount Helicon, hidden among singing trees and fragrant plants. The Hippocrene, that's a, a mythical river in Greece, the Hippocrene sings day and night. Its melodies fill my head. The muses were once objects of my scorn and my terror as they took both my, my vision and my voice. Now they seem my laughing daughters. When I was young, I was a fool, but I could sing. Now I am blind and dumb, no longer a fool. I do not sing these days. I can see a little light and shade as he rises, brief whiteness in the air. My fingers are supple. I practice daily on my lyre. Sometimes I hear them listening, feel their sweet breath wetting my cheek. Listening to me, to a blind and silent old man in a high and windy place. I tend the white-winged horse and spend my days and nights beside a mountain spring. Thank you.